We're going to talk today about how to be a good spouse. Now, I thought about having at least every spouse here set someone in between. It looks like Randy and Peggy's already done that. So, at least get somebody to like be done. You know what? Listen, we're all attempting to be the very best people God's called us to be. And we understand that, that uh, as we look at these scriptures today on what it is to, to, to be a, a good spouse, it, it's, it's important, I think, and I think as we look at this and glean from this, if you're not married uh, and you're thinking about getting married, don't. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> kidding, kidding. Okay. It's important to select a godly person to marry. I can, I can remember years ago, we were talking to a minister, and he says, hey, you know, that doesn't matter. And I'm like, really? If, if, if I didn't, if I wasn't married to a, a Christian person, I, there's a very good chance I wouldn't be one. You know what I'm saying? I think it's, it's very important that, that spouses come together. Now, here's the beauty. When you have two godly individuals, it still doesn't mean things are easy, does it? Or is it just me? Okay, it doesn't mean it's easy. And, and so there's going to be times, and I always like this, in a marriage where, where people will say, it's a 50-50. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's not a 50-50. Sometimes it's 100 to zero. You know, sometimes I'll tell them, I'm giving 100, you're giving zero. <laughs> she's like, really? <laughs> yeah. Blessing, she's not here today. She did say she was going to listen to this, so if you want to cut it off, then she <laughs> But anyway, so no, I think it's very important. Let's look at scripture. We're going to have a lot of scripture today. The main thing when we talk about being the greatest spouse we can be is we don't need to, I don't need to sit here and tell anybody anything. What we need to do is go to God's word. That is the most important thing we do. And I know we're all trying to live by that. So walking in wisdom today, we're going to talk about that. And, and, and that's going to be our focus. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says it this way. And I got to pull these glasses on uh, it says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. This is very important as we look at Proverbs, as we see, and we're trying to gain this wisdom from Proverbs. I love the Apostle Paul as he addresses his church. He says, we need to be wise people. But look how he closes that, that he says, don't act thoughtlessly. He says, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Listen, God is knocking on each one of our doors, and he's calling us to live faithfully, Okay. That's not always easy to do. Make the right decision. Walk as a Christian with wisdom. We're going to talk about these five things in these next five sermons. Wisdom in being a good spouse. Wisdom in family matters. Wisdom in matters of friendship. Wisdom in matters of business. And wisdom in our relationship with God. We talked last week, and, 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 and it says it this way in Proverbs 1. It says, there, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose, the book of Proverbs, their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline. To help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. I like that. You notice two disciplines there? It's very important. It's sometimes hard for me to be disciplined. Okay, To help them do what is right, just and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning of these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. And then it says it this way. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, and fools despise the wisdom and discipline. We talked about that uh, last week, and I want us to, to set it again. Someone who fears the Lord and is living for Him, God can do major things in your life and in your marriage. Remember that as we walk through the scriptures. God has a plan for marriage. I feel like I'm, I, I, I'm preaching here a little bit as we go through these next few verses because I use these a lot in weddings. And I, I was just, 
if you're married, I just want us to think about this a little bit. I want us to go back to that day. I'm the king, we're going to talk about it. That's okay. Of the day of, of, of the wedding. And the day where, where we were married to our spouse and, 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 and we committed to them. In Genesis 2, that was always God's plan. God's plan is that two would live together. And, and that we can see the beauty in that. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and of all the wild animals. But there's still no helper just right for him. The Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while the man slept, the Lord took out of the man's ribs, took one, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the other. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man complained, this one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She won't be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. A lot of scripture will say, and the two become one flesh. We look at that, and we see, we're going to see the importance of that. The Apostle Paul, in, in his letter to the Ephesians, talks very much about a marriage. I want to touch on this just, just briefly, because we're going to close out with this uh, scripture. But Apostle Paul's telling uh, this group of individual here in Ephesus and, and to the church and to us today, he says, I want you to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He says, for why just means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of a wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. It says, as the church submits to Christ, so why should you submit to your husbands and everything? For husbands... This means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. You see something going on here? What's our, what's our comparison to our marriage? It's important to see this all the way through. Two meanings here. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washing, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. Now, we'll deal with this at the end of, 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 of the sermon. So, so, but I want you to look at that, and I want you to see how Christ compares the church to a marriage, but very much in that life. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. See that from Genesis. This is, the this is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and a wife must respect her husband. So now I want us to go back to Proverbs, because... What I want to do is in Proverbs is, is look at Proverbs 31. So we'll first address the, the, the wives, the spouses here, the wives. And uh, I want us to, I want you guys to understand when you walk through the book of Proverbs, you're going to see it almost seems like an attack on the ladies. Okay. Don't take it that way. We're talking about Saul and talking to his boy. So you're going to see it all. You can reverse that. Okay. You can just turn that scripture around. Uh, but I think it's interesting. And we, we talk about. The woman in Proverbs 31. Now, there are different proverbial women all the way through here. We can say the ones, we can lift some up as, I don't want to be like that, and some up as, that is exactly what we want to be like. Wives, Proverbs 31, verse 10, following through the end of the chapter, that's, you, that's the lady. That's the lady that, that hopefully every guy is looking for. That this is the lady that blesses her husband, her family, and this is what we need to look for. So, ladies, as we read this, I want us to glean from it. How to be a good wife, the ideal wife. It's interesting, as it begins in verse 31 and 10 through 11. It says, the wife of noble character. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? Now, look closely. That virtuous and capable wife, she's, he, 
Uh, he says it's more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her, and she will greatly enrich his life. As, as we walk through the book of Proverbs, and, and we see this, and, and, and as the ladies look at their life, say, is this something we're doing? Are we enriching the life of our spouse? You can even turn back, husbands, and, and look at yourself. Are you enriching the life of your spouse? And, and so this is a great question. A lot of times when we deal with this, and, and, and it's, it's some marriages are, in, are struggling, and some marriages are doing well, but most of the time when they're not doing well, this is the problem. There's not a lot of enrichment going on. It says she brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. You see this as, as, as a picture of, ladies, that, that, that your goal in life is to bring him good, not harm, all the days of your life. It's a life that, 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 that loves your spouse. It's a life that is devoted to your spouse. It's a life that puts them first, just as it was vowed in the wedding ceremony. It's always interesting in the wedding ceremony. A lot of people, I'm, I'm very traditional when it comes to this. We go through all the things at a wedding ceremony. We can all go back and remember those days, don't we? And then there's always this, for better and for worse. You can always see when you're given that, it, it, it really it flows really easily. But then, you know, four or five years down the road, it's like, I did not know that was going to be the worst. This is serious. But then, and, and I think that a lot of us, you know, they'll be the for worses. We may be in a for worse. It may not always be better, but we got to remember in that wedding ceremony, this is what we're doing. We're devoting our life to our spouse. I think it's interesting. It says, she finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She's engaged. It says, she is like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household. And plan the day's work for her servant girl. She goes to inspect the field and buys it with her earnings. She plants a vineyard. She is energetic and strong and a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable and her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread. Her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has worn clothes. She makes her own bed sprays. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gate, where he sits with the other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the merchants. I look at that, and I, I know a lot of gals, you may be looking thinking, like my wife said. I am not sewing, period. I don't care what promise we're going to say. My mother do that. That's not the point. The point is whatever you do, whether in word or deed, you know, we're doing everything in the name of the Lord, aren't we? I mean, I mean we understand that. I don't know. It's just filling out this lady's life. Well, I don't know what your life is, but the bottom line is you are engaged. You have a passion for life. Because of God and your husband. That's what it is. We have a passion for life. I love passionate people. Being passionate is very important if we want to succeed in life, isn't it? It's important. And we're passionate about God. We're passionate about our husband. Your life revolves around that passion. I'm excited to get up in the morning. Why? Because I'm serving God and I'm serving my spouse. And, and it's interesting that it calls the ladies out and it says, ladies, here's what I want you to do. I want you to teach the younger ladies to love their husbands and their children. To live wisely, there's that word again, and be pure. To work in their homes. To do good. And to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. But you look at that, and that whole picture is, I want you to be a lady that your husband loves and respects you. And then what I want you to do is not only that, I want you to teach your young to do the same. That's the picture that we have for the ladies. 
It says she is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. Here's a woman that is in charge. Here's a woman that is, that is very active in, 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 in their life that, is, that obviously is not just working side by side with her husband, but almost looks like she's working ahead of him. I mean, she, here's a woman that is, that, 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 that is literally living life with great passion. She's clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. Why isn't she fearful? Because of her clothing, it says. <laughs> so in Christ, you who are all children of God through faith, for all of you who are baptized in Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. The reason this lady could, could, could say, I, 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 I'm passionate about life, I have no fear, is because she knows the one who can take away her fears. Okay? Very important. It is hard for a believer to be married to an unbeliever. Very hard. Go look at the scripture. Go look at the scripture. It's very hard. You know why? You know why it's hard? There's no commonality. The most important commonality in life is that commonality of Christ. So, so important. She has no fear because of her relationship with Jesus Christ. I love this. We talk about fearing God, and it's important to fear God. We understand the one who can destroy both body and soul and hell. We understand that that brings some to the cross, okay? And then in 1 John, it says, when we clothe ourselves with Christ, I want you to look at 1 John. What happens to fear? And so we know that and rely on the love God has for us that God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in man. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I like this, this because what it does is it allows this lady, when I think of this proverbial lady at 31, we see a lady that had no fear. Why? Because she knew God. She had clothed herself with God. And all the fear that she, she would ever have is cast out by Christ. It's amazing. The relationship with Jesus allows us not only to do that, but also then to change the type of person we are and put on the clothing that clothed Christ. In Colossians 3, 12 through 14, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion. Now, I want you to think for a second. This isn't just for the ladies. This is for the guys, for everybody. This is in our relationship. We can even go beyond marriage with this relationship because this relationship here is not just talking about marriage. It's talking about our life as we live it out. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Then it says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. I love this picture. This is a picture of relationships that work. And once again, this is a picture of, of, of a, two believers in a relationship. They're allowing God to work in that relationship. And, and you know what? You see the compassion, the kindness, the, the gentleness, and the patience. And, and when all that's working great, that's a wonderful thing. But sometimes it doesn't always work that way. I'm not always at my best, are you? I know this can come as a shock. Sometimes I even need forgiveness. You're right. That wasn't shocked. In relationship with money. Because we're not always going to be in the middle. We're going to be forgiven. You're going to see that in this relationship. You're going to see it in, in relationships all around us. We got to have most important thing to learn, husbands. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Most important thing to learn, wives. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Very important. There's a humility that is a must in a relationship. People talk about submission of the wives to the husbands. I will get to that. Will tell you it works on both ends of the Okay? There's not just submission from the wife to the husband, there's submission from the husband to the wife. 
Very important. Listen to Proverbs. When she speaks, her words are wise. And she gives instructions with kindness. There it is. That what we just read in Colossians, a woman that is that is that is clothed in these clothes of Christ. It says she carefully watches everything in her household. She suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Now look closely. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. One of the greatest things in my life is, is, is seeing people go. And, 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 and all that charm is gone. And, 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 and you know, sometimes they'll take a picture of, of when they were first married and what they are now, and you're like, and all the beauty is probably gone. But you know what? You know what? They just want to Every marriage ought to be able to look at that. That's what we want to be. That's what we want. Fear of the Lord is foundation and truth. But fools despise wisdom and grace. Okay, gals, now we get a turn. We get a look over the house and say, how are you doing? Okay. How to be a good husband? I, I look at this, and, 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 and I don't know why it just jumped out at me, but when I was reading that scripture, I was like, and her husband prayed with her. And I don't know, I've, I've read about it thousand different times, and I'm like, but for some reason it just jumped out at me, I thought, that is so important. Husbands, do we pray a lot? I mean pray a lot. I'm blessed. I'm a wife that really prays me. I've not always been good in the term. Okay? And so it's, it's a work sometimes. And it's, it's crazy. It's really easy, husbands, to be critical. I mean, we could pull up this Proverbs 31 and we'd start becoming very critical, couldn't we? But here's the problem with it. As flawed maybe as our wife is, I got news for you. Look in the mirror. You're just as flawed. Okay. A beautiful marriage realizes that. Two flawed individuals together. Two flawed individuals with the clothing of Christ trying to live out the very best we can. A, 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 a relationship that is willing to forgive when we need to forgive. What does that look like? I want to go back to Ephesians because I think it's so important. We talk about submission and, and we talk about ladies submit to your husbands. But I tell you in this scripture, he's saying the same thing for the husbands to do for their wives. He's saying, wives submit to your husband because husband, I need you to submit to your wife all of it. Now let's close on For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Now husbands, here's how I want you to treat your wife. Okay? I want you to treat your wife the same way that Christ treated the church. And how was that? That was a sacrificial love, wasn't it? That was a sacrificial love. Total sacrifice. To say, I'm going to give my life up to buy that church. For the husbands, this means love your wife just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or a wrinkle or any other flesh. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives, look closely, as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. I don't know how many spouses out here read books together. Mary, I think it's different. I'm going to tell you my background of reading marriage books together. I have highs and lows, but I'm pretty pathetic with that, okay? I'm not very good, but I will tell you something. There are books out there with the Word of God that really help in America. I think maybe some of us could say, hey, there was a time in my life where that was very important. One of my favorite books was what is called Cherish. And it was a very important book to me because it made me re-look at my life. Okay. In that book called Cherish, written by Gary Thomas, it says this. I have been entrusted with God's 
doctrine. I guess I've never looked at it that way. God entrusted me with his daughter. And you always ask, love her. He impressed me more than any I've ever read. I was like, yet yeah, that's very scriptural. Go back to Ephesians. <laughs> that's, that's what Paul's trying to tell us. Cherish. To cherish, to treat her well. What does that mean? It means to go out of our way to notice someone, to appreciate someone, to honor someone, and to hold someone near. That's what cherishing is. Husbands, we are called to cherish our wives. To put them above all in this world. To honor them above all. When it doesn't work this way, relationships fold. I can remember when, when my sister got married and uh, her husband was, was a member of the church. And he said, you know, she just has a hard time uh, being submissive to me. And I thought, huh? Do you see, if one person doesn't take this right, listen, a marriage is how many? Two people given 100%. But there'll be times that the one gives zero, you're going to need to give up. This is what it takes. We can't be grounded scripture. Have you ever used scripture to, to, to beat up on your spouse? Meaning, hey, you know what, you're falling a little short here. Let's, let's pick up the pace here. Who are you so high to cut down the one that God has entrusted you with? When I read these books, a lot of times I read these books, and, and I'm truly humbled by this. I can say, I've got a long way to go. A long way. And you'd think that, 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 you know, 37, 8 years, who's counting? You would, you would get this all right, but you don't know. And so I think it's so important, man, that we understand the importance of cherishing our wives. <laughs> this is how Paul said to do it. He says, love is patient and kind. I can be patient sometimes with a lot of people, but sometimes with my spouse, I'm, I'm not always patient. Does that anybody else ever, does that ever happen to you? See, this is what Paul's calling us to do. He's saying, hey, treat your spouse like we treat everyone else. Be patient and kind. Not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. That's hard. That's called what? Humility. It is not irritable. One of the hardest things is it keeps no record of being wrong. How are we doing for that, by the way? You ever keep a record? I'm up three to two today. <laughs> well, who's counting? I'm competitive, so I kind of do this kind of thing. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Now, let's listen. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It is always hopeful, and it endures through every birth. Now, I bring a lot of scripture to you because if I were going to tell you how to have a great, wonderful, successful marriage, and I would get up here and I would start preaching, my wife would probably declare her throat mom, if you know what I mean. We are imperfect, but God's word is perfect. Just remember that. We are imperfect, but God's word is perfect. It's never too late. It's never too late to work on your marriage to be the very best you. It's never too late. And so I, I, my challenge today is that if, if you're in a marriage just out of control, you got a chance to save it for you. If you're in a good marriage, I got news for you. Satan's gonna talk. You ever notice that? Right when you think everything's good is when Satan targets you. Right when we think we got everything, we look out and go, man, I am Joe Christian's house. <laughs> Satan. I want to close with this book that I that I uh, encourage all to read. Absolutely, my favorite book that I've ever read that deals with marriage. It's called The Four Laws of Marriage 
by Jimmy Evans. He talks about these four things. Law of priority, law of pursuit, law of partnership, and law of purity. Great book. Add it to your Bible study and make your marriage a very good marriage. God, our Father in heaven, we, we come to you this morning. And we know there are so many ways that, that we are imperfect as pastors. And God, help us to be passionate about life, but God, help us to be passionate about our spouse. Help us to love and, and cherish that spouse as we did in the beginning. Help us to always, always lift them up so they truly feel special and We pray for you.